So I recently did a video talking about why speakers, uh, you know, morphed over the years from being fairly wide and shallow to becoming narrower and deeper. And some of the reasons, at least in my opinion, that that transition has occurred over the last, you know, 40 years or so. Uh, somebody commented on that video and said, wait a minute, you didn't say anything about subwoofers. What about subwoofers? Um, they seem to have gotten smaller. Um, you know, why is that? And, you know, it's a really good question and I didn't even think to, uh, to talk about it in that video. So, hence I'm going to speak, uh, in my opinion, um, in today's video, why, why subwoofers have gotten smaller. Now, now, first of all, have they really gotten smaller? Now, um, many people will think that subwoofers are a new-ish thing that came about just, uh, you know, in the days of uh, the advent of home theater, but they've been around way, way before, before that. And many of them were large. I remember uh, subwoofers by some manufacturers that doubled as equipment stands. They were so big. Um, they were built into something that was an actual coffee table or end tables to try and hide them, but they were large. And, um, you know, part of the reason I believe that subwoofers have, have become smaller and smaller over the years, in most cases, not in all, is an aesthetic one. You know, as I mentioned in that previous video about when we came to the advent of multi-channel home theater and we had now to have, instead of a pair of stereo speakers, we had a pair of speakers, a center channel, a pair of surround channels, and probably a subwoofer. And just the visual impact on big boxes all over, let's say a regular or normal sized, uh, you know, living room or family room would be just too much. And one thing that came about in that, that advent of, of home theater was the fact that, you know, people wanted really small. There was this, this thing that was all the rave in the, in the 90s and, and pretty much into the early 2000s called the sub-satellite system, you know, where you had, you know, either five identical or four identical plus a little, uh, little center channel, all very small and then a smallish subwoofer to provide the base that all of those satellite speakers couldn't. But, you know, why did we go from subwoofers that were coffee table sized into some that are very, very small? You've probably seen some of those small little cube subwoofers, you know, maybe one foot cubed, um, you know, talking about uh, all these performance things, plays down to 18 hertz, et cetera, et cetera. Well, on the technical side, subwoofers, I believe, have, be, have become smaller. The push for aesthetics, yes. But what's made that possible is uh, modern electronics and driver design. What I mean by that is um, with the advent of cool running, high power in small packages, class D amplification, and DSPs or digital signal processors allowing, you know, all kinds of exotic tailoring and EQ of driver response and specifically limiting and compressors that you could accurately put the brakes on things before, you know, you blow up woofers and things like that. Those were very, two very important um, advents that allowed us to make subwoofers smaller. So I think the aesthetic demand, people love to have, you know, stuff a small little cube in the corner that it's unobtrusive and, and get great bass out of it. But, you know, why, why did we need uh, class D amplifiers and DSPs for these small subwoofers? Well, from a technical standpoint, if you think about it, Making the cabinet volume smaller and smaller and smaller means that the, the natural amount of bass, so the bass that, you know, a driver in a particular box can produce without any equalization, so it's natural response, we usually call it, uh, means that it's not going to have much bass. Uh, it's going to be significantly rolled off because of that small cabinet volume. 
So what can you do in that case? Like how do you get good base performance when you have very little cabinet volume? And the only way to do that really is with equalization. So we now boost those frequencies that are missing and now you can get a flat response and you can get a small little cube box that you know, will play down to 18 hertz. Well, the problem is, is that equalization consumes a massive amount of amplifier power. And also what it means is that, you know, this drive unit is operating in a small volume uh, of air where there's massive pressures acting on it. And so the, the driver, the woofer needs to be built in a very robust way so that the surround doesn't collapse because of the, the changing air pressure. Um, and you need a lot, you know, a lot of motor strength to overcome that pressure. So here's what you end up with. It's almost like the law of diminishing returns. You want a subwoofer in a small, 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 small box but the woofer itself, the motor, everything has to be so overbuilt that you suck up even more of the internal volume and you have less for the driver to operate with. Um, so that's, that's a really, really interesting thing. So how, how are we overcoming this? Well, like I said, we just need gobs of amplifier power. Uh, to apply that EQ and to overcome the very low efficiency of those systems. So if we have to really beef up a woofer and make things heavier and surround stiffer and all of those things, guess what? The natural efficiency of that woofer starts quickly going down. So we've got now a worst case scenario, really, from an engineering standpoint. We have almost no cabinet volume to deal with. We've got an inefficient uh, woofer working inside it, and we want decent output level and, and actually some bass so it, it performs like a subwoofer and not, you know, not a little bookshelf speaker. So we throw masses of amplifier power, and you've probably seen some of these small subwoofers claiming 1,500 watts or 2,000 watts or whatever of amplifier power, and in many cases that will actually be true and they have to sink a ton of power to overcome all of those limitations because the laws of physics can't be broken. There's no such thing as a free lunch in subwoofer design like pretty much everything else in life. And we, we just have to realize that everything uh, in subwoofer design is compromised. So if you want a small, small cabinet, um, there's gonna be some, some major trade-offs. I would say that a, an average size subwoofer, you know, like this uh, EP125, um, or a medium sized subwoofer, is likely in most cases gonna outperform one of those tiny little micro cube subwoofers. Um, one other thing to mention about those small subs is in almost every single case, you'll find that it's a sealed box or it's a woofer plus a passive radiator. You will never see one of those small cubes ported as a ported system, like, like many conventional subwoofers. The reason why, there's nowhere to put a port of sufficient size to tune that cabinet properly. Plus, because of those massive air pressures in that small volume that I was talking about, all you would get is port noise and whistling and wind noises and things wouldn't sound very good. So I hope that's cleared up that question. I do believe that overall, if we look going back to the earliest days of subwoofers to today, that they have on average become smaller and smaller, although many subwoofers are still large, many of them have become smaller. And the reason was twofold. One, it was an aesthetic and a demand from the customer base to make smaller subwoofers. And on the engineering side, the advent of things like Class D amplifiers and DSPs to allow us to actually try and break the laws of physics and get a massive amount of base output out of a small cabinet. So I hope that answers that question. Again, thanks for watching. Thank you very much for all of your comments. 
As you can see, like in today's video, it's from those comments that, you know, I get ideas for new videos and I'm happy to answer your questions.